Steve, I was reading an article mm -hmm. about brain machine interface. Yep. And how it was it was more talking about what it's going to be like in the future. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, like, so where is this today? How, how do machines and, and brains interface today? What's the technology today? And where will we be in the very near future? Yeah, this is a really fascinating topic. And we are right at, on the cusp, you know, of this technology. It's working now. It's just a matter of to what extent. So the, the basic idea is, is simple. You know, brains function through electricity, right? You could record that electricity. You could turn those, si those signals into digital signals that a computer can interpret. That's the basic idea. And we could do that today. And that works, absolutely. What, what are people doing so the, yeah, the, so the first applications are to get people to control prosthetic limbs, right? So if you have a, a, a robotic hand, you, know, you want to be able to close that hand just by thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. And we can do that. Is this an implant that's in the brain? So, th so now we're talking about the, yeah, the technology of it. Um, there's different ways to get that information. So, and that's really what the limiting factor is right now. Computers have no problem interpreting the electrical signals from the brain to do whatever we want them to do. You can control the cursor on a computer. Once you can control a computer, you can control anything that a computer can control, right? So right. whatever, if your home is, you know, you have a, a digital home, you could do anything. You could turn the lights on and off and control the temperature, whatever, as long as you can control a computer. If you can interface with something that's robotic, then you can control that that limb or whatever it is, your wheelchair, whatever it is, can communicate. It's all fine. The limiting factor is how we connect the electrical activity of your brain with the computer, right? Right. We, Today, like, don't they use like electrical impulses from muscles? That's one of the things that they could do. Okay. So they could one. So they can read uh, the contractions of the muscles, right? If you're trying to, you know, close a robotic limb, you could have the electrodes connected into the muscles that are, you know, that are still working in the forearm mm -hmm. and then respond to those signals by doing whatever, you, you know, it is you need the robot hand to do. Uh, the, the other way is to hook up directly into nerve endings. Or Can we do that today? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, or, so uh, wait, hold on. So connect yeah. to a nerve ending. Hold on a second. First off, it sounds painful. Yeah, well, that's a, that is a problem. The, you know, the, because nerves tend to die back, first of all, if there's nerve injury, and nerves can become painful. But if you do have any surviving nerve endings, you can read those signals. So you can read signals directly from the nerves. Okay. Even like in a healthy person, you could electrode on your arm, we could read the, the nerve set, uh, activity. Okay. So you can either read nerve activity or you can read muscle activity. The advantage of muscles is that it's much stronger electrical signal. The disadvantage is it's more crude, right? You have a whole muscle unit contracting rather mm -hmm. than just a nerve ending firing. The ideal, though, is to bypass the nerves and the muscles and go right to the brain. We get the information directly from the brain. So you could record those electrical signals at the scalp. Um, the advantage there is that it's easy. Mm -hmm. You know, you so hook up going electrodes to your skin. Head. Yeah. The disadvantage is that the signals are fuzzy, right? Because they get attenuated by the, the skull the, and the, the skin and everything. And that also makes reduces the resolution, right? So you get weaker blurrier information from the scalp, but it's easy. Mm -hmm. Or you could put the electrodes directly on the surface of the brain. And we've done this. We've done this. We've been doing this for decades. That gives you much better resolution, much better detail, uh, and much better like amplitude of the electrical signal that you're trying to record. Or the best is that you could put electrodes deep in the brain, right? Uh, what? How? We're doing that too. <laughs> what? Like you're sticking electrical wires, wires down into, into the somebody's brain. brain. How do they yeah. even know where to put the wires? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we, we use various techniques, imaging techniques uh, to stereotactically, that means three-dimensionally, right? Put the electrode exactly where we want it to be. So we do brief, deep brain stimulation, for example, uh, where we have to put the electrode right in the right place. We do it. It's not a problem. So, so what is the electrode in the brain reading uh, an actual... Neuron firing? No, not one neuron. We're not at that point yet. It's reading a group of neurons okay. firing. But ne neurons, as the saying in neurology goes, uh, neurons that wire together fire together, right? Okay. So they tend to depolarize to, you know, to send out their electrical signal as a group. Mm -hmm. So we're reading large groups of neurons all firing together. So what kind of intel are we getting out of the human brain with those, that type so, of... So, you know, what we're figuring out how to do is, let's say if we put a strip of electrodes 
on your motor cortex. And then you, you know, the subjects can learn, and even monkeys can do this, right? You could learn to then control something by thinking about moving. Mm -hmm. So let's say you don't have an arm, but you still have the brain that used to control that arm, and now you have it hooked up to electrodes, and so you think about moving your right arm, the computer sees those signals and then does something, right? And then you keep changing what you are trying to do until you learn how to interface with the computer and the computer learns how to interpret what you're thinking of so that your thoughts get translated into action. But this directly. is a one-way communication, right? It, it's not sending touch, feel, sensation, heat, and cold back yet or anything. They're working on that too. So there are uh, more, even the, up, up to a few years ago, they, they were developing systems that close that loop. So part of the problem with controlling your arm, a robotic arm with your motor cortex by thinking about it, is that it doesn't feel natural. It feels like you have something attached to your body and you don't, you know, you don't get the sensory feedback. Mm -hmm. And that sensory feedback is important to motor function because your motor cortex learns how to control the parts of your body by incorporating in real time that sensory feedback. Mm -hmm. So, so you have to basically be looking at the robotic limb in order to re and concentrating on it to move it. But what they've done is they've incorporated just vibration sense. So the, um, like the limb will give like haptic feedback. It'll vibrate, you know, when you touch things or when you move, and then that will send sensory information to the brain. And then that gives a much more realistic feel and allows you to control the limb much better. And you don't have to be staring at it in order to control it because you're getting that haptic feedback. So when will people feel a robotic limb feel like a real limb? That's, it's hard to say, like a real limb. Um, you know, I, I tend to think about it like if you imagine doing something with your non-dominant hand. It'll never feel like what it feels like with your dominant hand, mm -hmm. but it can feel to the point where you could use it functionally. You know, yeah. people who've been forced to switch to their non-dominant hand can eventually learn how to do things, but it's never the same, never quite the same. So it's probably similar. The, the big advantage here is that is brain plasticity. The brain can change its wiring and adapt pretty much to anything. Mm -hmm. and, and we didn't know this going into this 30 years ago or whatever. You know, if for example, you have an extra limb there's no place in your brain that maps to a third arm. It doesn't matter. Your brain can still figure out how to use it. It still can allocate resources to doing that. It, it's plastic enough that it could actually remap to differences in your body. Wow. And so, yeah, so there's really no limit, you know, except for the limits of plasticity, but we're learning how to enhance that too, you know, more stem cells or whatever. But what about the idea that we're already using 100% of our brain? So mm -hmm. let's say... Let's say they hooked up a robotic limb. Yeah. And it's, you know, it has the wires going into your brain and everything, but your brain has absolutely no idea that there's a limb there. Mm -hmm. Right. So through the use, right, through, through you tr trying through you to do using, it, you see the limb, right? Yeah. And that's part of your important feedback. If it's giving you any sensory feedback, you feel it. And then your brain takes that information and can incorporate it in, into its model. So some of region in your brain will just all of a sudden develop. So the, neurons. the thing is, well, no, it doesn't develop new neurons. It's using existing neurons. I okay. mean, it will might recruit stem cells, you know, to make to make new connections. But again, remember, we're thinking like, if you're replacing a lost limb, then you have that it's already cortex in there. there. Okay. If you're trying to add, it's a zero sum game. You only have so many neurons. So we, yeah, it takes away from other things. Um, but the well, the cool thing is, is that your brain already does this. Like for your for the existing parts of your body. It's right. already using sensory feedback, visual feedback, proprioception, tactile touch, in order to make you feel as if you own and control the limb. That's already an active thing your brain's doing. Yeah. And so it's very easy to get your brain to think that it owns and controls something that's not already part of you. There's a the famous experiment now where if you're sitting at a table like this, you put your arm under the table, you have a, a prosthetic limb on like, you know, a mannequin limb on top of the table. And then if somebody touches, you see somebody touch the fake limb while somebody touches your real hand in the same place at the same time, your brain now thinks this is your arm. Yeah. Because it felt the, the feeling and, there's, and the vision coincided. That's enough. Yeah. A lot of the times, not 100%, but a lot of the times, that's enough to trick your brain into thinking, oh, that's my actual arm. Yeah. And it feels like that's your arm. So because that that already exists in the brain, that's already how the brain works, it's really advantageous because you can easily trick the brain into thinking that it owns and controls a robotic limb as long as the sensation is there. Well, how about other stuff now? How about like 
thinking into a computer and it'll type out the words that you're thinking. So that takes a lot more resolution than what we're currently using just to like make a hand open and close, uh, for example. And so this is now where we get into the technical limitations. There's no theoretical limitations to the brain machine interface technology. The brain plasticity and converting both signals input and output, there's no limit mm -hmm. theoretically we could have the matrix. The matrix can can work where yeah. you are, you feel like oh you're in a completely God. virtual <laughs> world. The limitation is literally the physical electrodes. It's the ability to physically connect with the neurons in your brain. And this, and this is really the challenge. And there's a few limitations here. One is that the if you have hard electrodes like wires, you know, the brain subtly pulsates and moves. I know you love this. Yeah, Jay. right. But the, uh, the, the wires won't, and so they, they sort of rub up against the neurons, and after years of that happening, scar tissue forms, and that blocks the connection to the wires. It's also a, a pathway of possible infection, and you also have to power them, so you gotta get some, some heat in there, I mean, some energy in there without creating heat, because if you overheat the electrodes, then that destroys the neurons as well. So we need soft electrodes that could move with the brain that don't require a lot of power and won't heat up. Mm -hmm. But we also need them to be very small yeah. so that they can be reading only a very tiny cluster of neurons. That's how you get the resolution. You don't want to read a thousand neurons firing once you want to read 10 neurons firing. So once. this is a hardware it's issue. It's a hardware right? issue. It's totally a hardware issue at this point. And as the hardware improves, the applications of the brain machine interface will also improve. We'll be able to do more stuff with it. You know, maybe eventually get to the point where we can actually just think words and have a computer type them out. That's no reason why that can't happen because mm -hmm. it's happening in your brain. There's some specific pattern of activity that equates to certain sounds, et cetera. And so a computer can absolutely learn that, but it just needs the information at a high enough resolution to do so. And that's, that's the limitation. And then we, and we go many years down the road, we, we might be able to add in a new region to the brain that's artificial. Well, once you get really high resolution, long-term interface, physical interface with the brain, then the, you know, the possibilities open up. That's what you would need for a matrix style kind of application. Yep. But also, you know, you imagine interfacing with a computer so that it, it in to such an extent that it's really just an extension of your brain. Mm -hmm right? Then we're all psychic at that point, right? We can communicate through radio signals, through Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, yeah. you know, with, uh, with the hive mind or with each other or with computers. Then we're like living in the cloud. And then we're hackable. Yeah, then we're hackable too. Yeah, <laughs> right. absolutely. Oh, then then we're, ah! we are a computer at that point. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And that's going to happen. There's, again, there's no theoretical reason. It's just purely a technological limitation. It's just a matter of how, you know, we're going to be able to make those electrodes small. And people are already working on these like hair like micro electrodes for now that appears to be the future of like the really high resolution connections we're also working on a lot of all right good enough connections that could just expand our applications like putting them inside the veins inside the brain mm -hmm. so they're under the skull they're close to the brain tissue so that gives us a huge bump up but it's not invading the brain tissue itself. Right, right. Um, again, that's not going to be enough for the matrix, but that'll be enough for better robotic control or better you know, control of your environment or communication with the computer. Um, so we're following multiple angles here. We'll get there, but it's going to be a while before the, the hardware technology is really there. The software is already there. It's like not the limiting factor at this point. It's really just a hardware problem. So what you're telling me is that cyborgs will exist someday. They already exist. We already have cyborgs. It's a matter of degree. But the yeah, the really advanced cyborgs where you have fully robotic controllable limbs that are indistinguishable in function, maybe even enhanced in function from a human, we absolutely will have that that one day. There's no again no reason why not. Oh my God. It's coming. <laughs> We will be our futuristic robotic overlords. We will be our, they will, they will be us, right? We don't have to fear AI because we will be the AI. It'll be part of our brain. We don't have to fear from robots because we will be them.